The eyes of the Father. The eyes of the Father. You can use the screens. To and fro. He's searching the He's earth. Searching the earth. He's looking for us. He's looking for us. And we'll make intercession. We'll make intercession. On behalf of the On nation. Of the nation. Those who will rise up and pray. Those who will rise up and pray. We'll stand in the gap. Stand in the gap. This is how we stand in the gap on our knees. that we go down on our knees and we take a stand in the spirit and we thank you in advance in Jesus name Amen. Amen. thank you thank you thank you sound of heaven thank you you may be seated okay welcome to church ah everybody looking good 
Some looking Nigerian, some looking from the abroad. But you're welcome to the house of the Lord. Could you be kind enough, warm enough to say hello to somebody on your right and your left? Yeah. Just sing a lot of faces. Faith, I see you. I see you. We're small enough to know you, large enough to love you. Ah, someone's hiding. A dear man of God is hiding. But at the house of kings, <laughs> we know how to bully elders. I tried to get him out, but he didn't, he didn't work. So I told him, I told him, don't worry. I'll, when I take the microphone, um, my thugs will... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they're here, they're here. you hear from them in a couple of seconds. Yeah, yeah, you go. Cool. <laughs> The amazing Pastor Chooks, father of Judah, is here. If you remember him, can we bring him up to Pastor Jakes, father of Judah? Yes, Pastor Jakes. What did I say? Oh, forgive me. Yeah, Jakes, Pastor Jakes. Please, um, we, we won't stop clapping until he takes us takes a seat. That's how we bully. House of Kings, come on, do it the way I taught you how. I want to, I want to thank all my thugs for helping me doing this successfully. God bless you all. My protesters. Okay. They said they're not my talk. They're my protesters. This guys kind of know who they are. We love you. And we welcome you, sir. Thank you. So good to have you here. Amen. Okay. Um, now to the word of God. Ecclesiastics chapter 10, verse, verse 15. <laughs> um, it's a beautiful service. So we're going to be. I love it when we have Thanksgiving service and we're dedicating children to the Lord. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's one of the highest honors. And it's amazing. And we're still on the series, the health and wealth, you know, uh, teaching. Apostle Bob was here. It was a wonderful time in the presence of the Lord. And today's Thanksgiving service, I've been saying it over and over and over again so I can remind myself not to neither teach nor preach. I'll just read you a couple of scriptures. Because the goal of today's service is really to dance in the presence of the Lord, thank him for all the wonderful things he has done, and dedicate our precious baby to the Lord, and we'll do everything else. So please make sure you have a Thanksgiving offering, a special offering. We're going to take and we're going to dance. The other wonderful thing we're going to do in the service is we're going to have the bread, the flesh and the blood of Jesus served. And I can assure you, this will go on until the end of the year. Every service until the last Sunday in December is a communion service. That's amazing if you know anything about the power, the significance, and how much we hallow and honor this gift of God to us. So I want you to get ready. Um, the, the battle um, has become bloody. So we, we can't only be drinking coffee. We have to start drinking blood. Mm, they're spilling blood. And we, we have the blood of the eternal covenant on our side. And this is not time to put it away. This is how we fight our battle. Glory to God. So I'm excited. This is, I just want to help you get into what God has put in this thing today. Because this thing is on assignment. I'm just take you one scripture. Just I'll make sure I don't do more than one scripture. Give you the communion and be out of your face so we can dance. Glory. God help the preacher. But even if he doesn't, it's our church. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 15. The labor of the foolish. Weary at every one of them. Because he knoweth not how to go. To the city. Can we read it together? 
in concert. One, two, read. Because to the city. The Lord bless the reading of his word in our hearts. <laughs> yeah. The labor of the foolish weary at every one of them. Let me make that, let me bring that home. That scripture is saying that every foolish person has the same issue. When they labor, they are weary. And the reason is because they, they don't know the way to the city. So when he says the labor of the foolish wearies every one of them, he's not talking about the friends of the foolish. He's saying anywhere in the world you ever meet a foolish person, one classic indication that you are face to face with somebody dealing with that disease called foolishness is this same thing we're talking about. So when he's saying the labor of the foolish wearies every one of them, he's talking about everyone within the class that this scripture calls foolish. It will always weary them. Their own labor. Because they know not how to go to the city. A deep look into this scripture will reveal a couple of things. Maybe three things. And then we take the communion. Father, thank you for the anointing to teach. In Jesus' name. One thing that's shocking from this scripture, although you may be distracted by the idea of a foolish person, please don't, don't be carried away. Because when I'm done, you'll find out why you shouldn't be carried away. Why? Foolish is standing out right now. Okay? In this scripture, I want to try and de-emphasize that word so, so that I can get out from it what you need to know. There's something powerful here, and that is the word labor. This scripture is showing us something that you would not see except the Lord shows you. And it is that even a foolish person knows the value of labor. So whoever attempts to make progress, enter into wealth and health, anything within the category of the blessing, and is not laboring, is less than a foolish person worse than a foolish person because this guy is foolish but he's laboring. That's why it says the labor of the foolish. I thought that his foolishness should lead to laziness. He's foolish but he's not lazy. The dignity of labor has not been sacrificed on the altar of foolishness. He has maintained the power, the import of labor. Although he has a disease, he has deficits somewhere, but he still knows the use of labor. And the reason I'm talking like this is because I want to show you the science of favor and bring certain things to the balances. Many times in our circles, when we pray for you about labor, your amen will not be loud. But when we tell you that there will be favor, in fact, that every labor will become favor. There's this common prayer, this prayer for us when we finish our YC. Now, we are leaving the labor. We are not coming into the... We are coming into the... As though... Um, to enter favor, we have to stop to labor. That's the assumption. And it's killing a lot of Christians. It's killing a lot of Pentecostals. So when we say favor, they don't know what we mean. What they hear is excuse from labor. When we say the Lord put his favor on your life, they're saying, they're hearing cheat codes. quick fix. That's not it. No. This guy is foolish. But he's laboring. The advert to the meeting said, the king's way to wealth. The first boulevard, the first street you need to be on, on your way to wealth, the king's way is labor boulevard. 
you must be laboring. If you're not laboring and you're but you're claiming favor, you are of all men. Your guess is as good as mine. Mm. And this is because God labors. He works. Jesus worked and works. The first way to legitimately lay claims to favor is to first embrace the idea of labor. Now, some of you are busy, but you're not laboring. And they call, oh, why did you miss my call? I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy, you're always busy. Busy has become what you tell people you don't want to talk to. It's the reason why they didn't get through to you. Yes. Yes. But except you're working with everything God has given you, you're not laboring. Although you may be busy. By busy, I mean activity. If what you're doing is not coming from the core of your, of your being, how God piped you, if you're not, if you're not doing life from, from purpose, from your ordination, if you're not doing life from the core, from what God called you to do, you may be busy, you may be working, and you may be working five jobs, but you are, you are not laboring. And when it comes to wealth, the king's way, let me let you know that the first thing we must ensure we are doing is that we are laboring. There's a way the New Testament addresses us. It says we are co-laborers. And that won't take any favor away. We don't have to remove labor so that we can get favor. No. In fact, favor is for all who truly labor. Claiming favor without laboring would uh, would be would be something like what those people do on the streets when they're begging. They're asking for favors, but they don't want to labor. In fact, a job they they don't want a job. Do you know that? There's those kind of people out there. They just want favor. They believe that they can do life by favor. And they pray for you that if you favor them, God will favor you. And you're like, that's good, but if if I run like that, I won't have what to give you. So I know you like fish. Let me give you hook. They say, no, 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 no. They don't want hook. In fact, the Bible says that we should labor to enter into our rest. Not pray to enter into your rest. That rest is for those. On your way to wealth, the king's way, make sure that with your busy schedule and your working five jobs, make sure that you are, you are laboring, that you are a laborer. This is the Pentecostal. Deuteronomy is the first book in the Bible that properly um, lists out the blessings of God to the children of God. That book is dedicated to, to the announcement of the blessing of the Lord for those who obey the Lord. And the curses, the woes of the Lord for those who do not obey the voice of the Lord. That's the most profound thing you find in that book. And there's, there's so much of it from one till the end. Genesis is about creation. Exodus is about the Exodus. Leviticus is, is about the priesthood, the genealogy. But when it comes to Deuteronomy, one of the most powerful things you find there is the blessing. And since it's the book of blessings, you need to see the book of blessings. First, People who have what is called the work of hand. Deuteronomy 
if I would collapse Deuteronomy into one, that whole book, into one sentence, this will be what I would say. May the Lord bless the work of your hand. May the Lord bless your basket. May the Lord bless your kneading bowl. That's what I would reduce the whole book of Deuteronomy to. Work of your hand. Because God needs a vessel. Basket. Uh, is the work of your hand, but another on another level. Because your basket collects more than your hand can collect. But your basket was weaved by your hands. And the third dimension of blessing you find in the book of blessings is the blessing on your kneading bowl. Your kneading bowl is, it is the bowl where many women who want to make and they want to knead flour come out to the market square and bring their dough. That big bowl where everybody is pressing flour. Huh? At the same time, where everybody's doing that thing, that big boat that can accommodate everybody with a walk of hand, mm. is called a needing boat. Yeah. Are you still there? Yes, yes. sir. Yeah. To emphasize that when God promised you the blessing, the first thing you should check is: Am I, am I laboring on any of these three dimensions? Do I have a walk of hand? Do I have a basket? Do I have a needing boat? Because the demand of new wine is new wine skin. That's the first interesting thing about here. And this thing is so profound that even foolish people know it. Foolish people do it. There's no substitute for labor, even amongst the foolish. They still somehow know that laboring is, is inexcusable. I'm laying foundations for a lot of teachings I will be doing. The second thing that's strong in this verse of scripture, the labor of the foolish wearies every one of them, every foolish person, because you know it not how to go to the city. The next thing that's important is to know from this scripture is that um, when the Bible says he's foolish, it just means that he has some kind of deficit he 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 lacks not knowledge but adequate knowledge about something that's important for his life and so when the bible says let him that needs wisdom ask because God will give it freely and you will not upbraid. He's saying that when it comes to moving from one level to the other, one of the things you have to continue to make up for as you progress and as you add more and as you grow up in the things that God has called you to do is you need to continue to acquire knowledge. If the favor of the Lord has gone ahead of your revelation knowledge of him, you are becoming foolish. I'll say it again. If you allow God's favorable blessing on your life, go way ahead of the revelation that you have of him, you will soon destroy the favor of the Lord. I'll say it again. If you allow the favor of the Lord go ahead of your experiential knowledge of the Lord, you will be in that space they call foolish because you are getting more blessings than you know how to do anything with. It's like continuing to supply the best and most sophisticated gadgets to the guy who cannot read and write. Intentions were right. The guy too is happy, but it is not exactly useful for him and so as the lord continues to promise us and talk to us about the blessing we have a responsibility to make sure that we have a level of understanding that will match what is coming 
Else, when it comes, we will, we will trivialize it. I hope you know I can sit on this thing. I can sit on this speaker and it will bear my weight. Is that true? And when I sit on it, if I, if I set it up well, I may feel comfortable. Is that true? I may even feel more comfortable than certain stools that maybe are too low for me to sit on. The fact that I feel comfortable sitting on the speaker doesn't make it a stool. What's the purpose of this? Will the purpose of the speaker change because I am comfortably sitting on it? Yes. That's what happens when you are getting things that you are not upgrading yourself into. Yeah, the guy with the hammer thinks every problem is a nail. That's all he has. So the next street you have to be on is this street on your way to wealth the king's way. It is that you have to continuously ensure that you provide new wineskin, new perspective. And so, let me put it this way. And I think this will get me where I'm going to on time. Foolishness will be working hard on something you don't know enough about. Your work is hard. Your intentions are correct. But because there's, you know, many times when we describe diseases, we're actually talking about certain things that are go wrong in the body because certain things are are not there. You know, there's a deficit of something that causes you to lose your ease. You are now at the state they call this ease. Your ease is gone. You're without your ease because certain things have malfunctioned. And some of us are working on things that we have not asked enough questions about. Questions from God, questions from people. And because we do not know and we have not acquired enough understanding, adequate knowledge about it, I would beg that we, we wait to upgrade before we receive from the Lord. Are you still here? Am I too slow this morning? Okay. It's because of where I'm going that I am threading this carefully. Let's talk about this foolish guy. The labor of the fool wearied every one of them because he knoweth not how to go to the city. This is his problem. We've described his labor. We've described his state of foolishness. And it looks like every now and then me and you are there because you know, sometimes we don't know enough for the things that we ask. I had a conversation with my wife this morning and I said, said it again. I said, can you dare to be blessed? His real problem is that he's expecting his labor to give him what only God can. He's laboring, but he doesn't get into the city because although his labor is good and correct, his expectations from his labor are unreasonable. His labor has a role to play, but his labor cannot by itself get him into the city. His labor wearied him because he knows not how to go to the city. So what he truly lacks his navigation, his direction, his guidance, and he's hoping that with hard labor, he will know how. See the way they are looking at me this morning. <laughs> Glory to God forevermore. What he does not know is that your life goes in the direction of your head. Not your hands. 
So he is laboring, but he's not making progress because he's asking the work of his hand to do only what should come from the head. When it comes to wealth, health, the blessing of the Lord, we only progress, make progress in the blessing of the Lord head first. What you call a breach when a child is being born? Is it that the child is dead? The child is not healthy? What's a breach? And why is there so much problem when a child is breached? He's refusing his position. He's not coming out head first. And in this life, you, you are a problem. If you are attempting to make progress any way apart from head first. Yes, it starts the day you were born. It stays like that till you see Jesus. And this guy is foolish because he's a laborer. But nobody taught him that progress is made. Somebody say head first. Head first. Yes. Give me the scripture. There's, I'm untangling it very carefully. And so keep it there with me. The labor of the foolish wearies every one of them because he doesn't know how to go into the sea. Now I'm going to share with you what the foolish man doesn't know so that there will be deliverance first in this service. We all need deliverance first. We receive deliverance by this revelation that we take the communion. Amen. Because God is ready to give us certain things and all he's demanding of us is that we know we know how. Somebody say amen. amen. The psalmist puts it this way. He anoints my head with oil. And what happens next? My cup runneth over. Teaching us the connection between what is on your head and what is in your pulse. The oil touched the head, but it's not the head that is running over. It's the cup. How do you explain that oil is poured on your head and it is the oil on your head occasioning the overflow in your cup? It's teaching you that your life, the abundance in your life, will only go in that it's a reflection, a direct reflection or whether there is oil on your head or not. Yes, that's what it's saying. He anoints my head with oil. And then I notice, not first that my head is shining. That's not what happens. I look at my cup. My cup is not getting the oil. The oil is not on my cup. Yes, the, my cup is what I want to drink. But I notice that the more I stay under oil and my head is in contact with oil, my cup seems to teaching us something about wealth and increase. And how your life is designed to always go in the direction of where your head is tucked. Somebody say head first. Head first. Head first. So if we deal with his foolishness, which is a head matter, we will solve the issue with his labor. Are you still there? The labor of the foolish does what? Because he knoweth not how to go to see. My time is up and we have not finished untangling this scripture. Okay, final point. The, the third thing that is powerful in this scripture and teaching you wealth the king's way. And I'm not showing you things you would read in any book in Harvard or go and read those ones, okay? There's principles, there's all kinds of nice things. Go and get them. I'm teaching you spiritual dimensions for these things. It is that he desires to go to a city but does not know how. But he is a laborer. Then we have diagnosed his problem. It's, it's head first. He's breached somewhere. And so his labor is not yielding. Where does, he ad, where, where does he desire to go to? Everybody say it to me. The city. What is 
What is this city? The Thanksgiving service, amen? The city. The Bible says that if any man be in Christ, that man is a new... One, one version says creation. Another says creature. I understand the confusion. It's because when you are in Christ, you are a new civilization. You are a complete new civilization. It's for... Um, the lack of explanation... Words are failing to explain what happens when you are... When you got born again, something happened that beats explanation. You became something. It looks like a new creature. But it also looks like a whole new creation. It's a spiritual civilization that entered you when you got born again. And that's why scholars had a problem truly describing it. Whether it's creature or creation, I would call it... A spiritual civilization. So that that word is fluid enough to capture whether it is a creature or a creation. It's a civilization. It's a spiritual civilization. Amen. Okay, that's what happened. So when you were born, if you are the night this is good for you. If you were born, when you were born, beg your pardon, when you were born, you were born a person. When you were born again, you became a place. It's an entire civilization. Somebody must teach you that. When you were born of your mother, you, a person was... Your, your mother could not have given back to Abuja. She had to give back to a person. But when God picked you and redeemed you, what he turned you into is, that, is a complete creation. It's a complete civilization. And that's how God sees you. God sees you more as a place than he sees you as a person. And you must see yourself the way God sees you. That's why the Holy Ghost calls you his temple. Not his friend. Because to him, you are, you are his place. You are not his. You are his resting place. You are his abode. You are this. That place where the Holy Ghost dwells is, is a city. The name of the city is Zion. The city this guy is trying to go into is not external. That city is in, in, in himself. He knows himself as a person, but didn't know that he's a complete city. And he does not know how to go into what is resident within him. So he's looking for something that is in his Sokoto. And he has gone to Sokoto. Sokoto is the Yoruba word for interprets now trousers. It is in his Sokoto. It's in his pocket. But he has traveled to Sokoto. This city is not external. The journey to this city is a journey to himself. He doesn't know the way to the city. Do you remember that God made places before he made people? He said, let us make man. For five out of the six days of active creation, he spent it making places. Territory first before personality. In the order of things. Six days. So that where the person will come to was ready before he brought the person. So when he thought, let us make a person. He, we didn't see a person. We saw sun, moon, stars, firmaments. That thing went on for six whole days. That's how God thinks. That's how God operates. God made the city first. It is Am I boring you? Please don't be bored. It's communion we want to take. That's, that's what's leading us like this. There is a civilization within you. There's an empowerment within you. 
the communion we are going to take today is going to bring it out. Yes. Some of the things you are hoping people will do for you, God has finished it inside you. Somebody needs to show you the way into that city. What is a city? A city is the land of more options. That's what a city is. More possibilities. Why do people leave the village and go to the city? What are they looking for? Is the air in the city different from the village? What are they looking for? It's, it's, not, it's not for the joy of strolling that people come to the city. It's not even because your friend is, has changed her dress. No. You watch Nigerian movies. Say, I came to Lagos from the village. What is he telling you? I didn't come to play. Oh. I came for more. The labor of the foolish will irritate every one of them because he does not know the way to all the possibilities, all the blessings that are his in Christ Jesus. That's what he doesn't know. Say, I'm a city in the Holy Ghost. That's who you are. That's why the Bible declares that the name of the Lord is a tower. A tower is the same word fortress. Fortress is the same word city of refuge. The name of the Lord is a place. When you call it, it's a place that is activated. You are transported into a place. When you say, in the name of Jesus, you know what happens? A territory activates for you. Where everything you could possibly want is resident. The name of the Lord is a tower. When the righteous calls the name of Jesus, he runs in and then he is... So more, more happens territorially when you call the name of Jesus than personally. It's the territory that happens when you shout, Jesus! That name is a place. You entered a place when you got saved. You did. And everything you need is in that place. Well, thy riches are in his house and his righteousness shall endure forever. So, in the world of people, it is those with territorial language and understanding. Don't worry, I'll come around, okay? It's those with territorial language and understanding that rule. Because it is places before... Talk to me now. Before people. It's places before people. God is giving somebody new places in the Holy Ghost. This is why... um, while Abraham was talking to God about a child, God was talking to him about territory. Abraham would go and pray, say, Lord, Abba, I'm 75. I'm getting old. Okay, I'm 76. I'm 77. I'm 80. Oh, I'm 90. I'm 100. You promised me. God would say, hey, come, let's throw. Look, look, look at the stars of heaven. Can you count them? Say, God, it's not, it's not, I'm, it's not stargazing we're talking about. I am going childless. God said, okay, the sand by the seashore. I said, what is wrong with this? I'm, I'm trying to have a conversation about personality that has not arrived. You, you are talking about territory. And then he comes back again and says, God, 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 my wife is old. She's, she's tricking in here. She, she cannot bear. She has become a ridicule. Small servants in the house are talking to her. And it's just this child problem. There's no child. And God says, um, stand on that cliff. Look, as far as you can see. like it was frustrating so he did not know the way to the city and his labor in prayer was wearying him because while God was talking territory he was talking talking about Isaac I came to let you know that your destiny is to territory you're not just supposed to be a nice person that came to this world, paid bills, and died. No. I came to remind you, God sent you here at such a time as this. And uh, there are destinies that depend on your, your life. And half of your experience in heaven when you, when you stand before the Lord is you need to listen to all the people who say thank you that you came. 
because their lives were changed because. Okay. So when, when we talk about we don't put money for state in personal bank accounts. If you are still thinking as a person, a certain weight of glory you will never handle. Because territorial allocations is for territorial people. Say amen. 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 Today you are going to ask God for territory. That the Lord will enlarge your territory. When you pray that prayer, one of the things that will happen is God will give you ideas that will solve somebody's problem. You didn't say amen because you are tired of the ideas. I know you have many ideas, but there is the idea. All those many ideas you've been getting, the reason they are not working is because they are supposed to be teetered on one idea. The spare head idea has not come. That's why you tried one. It failed. Then you tried another one. You did not get the, the, the point. The point is, get all the secondary ones and prepare yourself because I'm going to give you the that will drive so don't, don't worry that you, you're a jack of all trades. It's in the plan that God will make you vast in many things first. Then he will hand you territory. And say, okay, buy this one now. All those things I've been talking to you about for 15 years. This is where all of them meet. You have to stay with God until that point. And not get rid of, I can do this now, but it didn't work well. I, can do, I know this one guy. He cannot do half as much as me. It's breaking through. You don't know. You don't know what God has given. You don't know who you are. You, you think you're a person. You don't know that you are. When you stand up, it's a city that got up. A whole city that got up. Complete in itself. Do you understand? Okay. They say they understand. Since they do, I believe they do. Then, let's end it like this. Luke 24, 13. Luke 24, 13. Two people were walking after Jesus rose from the dead. Two, two of his disciples, Cleopas and some other guy, were walking and they were, they were worried about the resurrection. They heard rumors that Peter said Jesus had resurrected. The women said Peter. Jesus had resurrected. They were really sure what the, pro, what the truth of the situation is. It was rumors, rumors, rumors. And so they were having a conversation and they were walking to a certain place called Emmaus. See, and behold, two of them that went the same day to the village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score four longs. I can't read this because of time. Okay, let me tell the story. Yes. They were walking to a village and as they were walking, verse 14, oh boy, they were talking about everything that happened about Jesus' resurrection. 15. And as they were walking and talking about Jesus, Jesus appeared to them and was walking with them. And they were strolling together. But their eyes were holding that they could not see that the person walking with them is the person they are talking about. Something held their eyes. And he said unto them, uh -uh, guys, what are you guys talking about? What, what communications are this? And why are you looking sad? And they rebuked him. Uh, don't you know what's happening in Jerusalem? Cleopas answered him, are you a stranger? Don't you know what happened these last few days that, uh, you know, this person, <laughs> somebody said lucky shooting. No, this is, this is the, it was Jesus who died this time. And then Jesus asked them, he said, what things, what things happened these last few days in Jerusalem? And they said, okay, it is a Jesus of Nazareth. Since you are, you are not in this world, let's tell you. Um, Jesus of Nazareth, he was a prophet, did many mighty deeds, you know, and before God and all the people. 20. The chief priests picked him up, handed him to be dead, crucified him. 21. Um, and we thought it was him that would redeem Israel from Rome and the Roman rule. But he, he died. He, and it's been three days that all of this happened. We really had faith in this guy. He was good. He was powerful. And some women made us astonished. They said that they were there some days ago and they saw him. 
arise and they did not see his body and blah 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 there was a vision of angels they said Jesus is alive and certain of us that's Peter and co went to the sepulchre and they found it so as the women said but they also didn't see him it's very confusing then he said to them what we just read <laughs> he said all oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. 26. What not Christ have to suffer have ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? See, they were going to a village, then the city of God appeared to them. I was walking with them. They had chosen a village for their lives. These happenings were in Jerusalem. Stay in Jerusalem, confirm that the things that you heard are true or not. You left Jerusalem. You left one city. And then you chose to go to... Uh, you're a disciple, oh. You're supposed to be with the remaining disciples. We're still sorting matters out in Jerusalem. You chose village life. And God, in his mercy, decided to bring all of Zion to you on the road. And you were questioning him. You were questioning your city dimension. Because you are going to a village. <laughs> and then Jesus began from Moses to begin to expound to them. That's what, that's what a city is. It's, it's about all the, all the options. He began to expound to them. He began to open things up to them. Concerning himself. They still didn't know it was him. Foolish people. And as they got closer to the village, he, he behaved as if he was going to another village. And they told him, they said, no, 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 come to the village with us. They're asking the city of God to come to the village, to collapse itself into a village. The day is fast spent, just chill with us. And he agreed with them, agreed to stay with them. And as he sat and meet with them, he did what I am about to do for you. This is what takes you to your city. Yeah. Go back, go back, go back. 30. He took bread. He blessed it. This is how he snatches you from, from the village. From foolishness. This, this is how God... Op- Everybody's seeing problem. You suddenly can see opportunity. You have... Your eyes are not holding. You can see things. You can see through obstacles. They are crying that things are going bad. But in your mind, you're like, no, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. It door just opened here. The, the Bible says he took bread, blessed it. Break it, gave it to them. I was looking at them to see if their eyes will be open. And choose the city over the village. Next verse. Move now, move. Yes, I'm out of time. It's Thanksgiving Sunday. Their eyes were opened. They knew it was him. The moment they knew it was him, what did he do? The job was done. Then they said to one another, Kai! Oh my God! Did our hearts didn't... Didn't our hearts burn within us while he spoke to us by the way? Don't forget that foolish people don't know the way to the city. He said, when we were by the way, when he was talking, I just thought, I didn't know who it was, but my heart was burning. Was your own heart not burning? They were like, yes. Something was boiling within me. And why he opened the scriptures to us. And then they rose up the same hour and did what? That was the end of village life. <laughs> yes. And then they found the 11. There are certain things, everybody say Nigeria is in problem, but God has buried some of his solutions inside you. This communion, we call that thing out. Amen. Every time you've been praying, you are, and I talk about a Moses, a Joseph, a Nehemiah, a Gideon. You are thinking about one politician that will soon print flyer and poster. That's what comes to your mind. That's, that's the village. Yes. Yes. So this has failed in the nation. That has failed. And you're like, ah, hope God will send us somebody. They are always expecting the external. God said, no. You are, this, you are the answer. Amen. You are the civilization. God has buried and God said that you serve with this communion so that your quota in the healing of the nation, your quota to the territory will come out. And then your eyes will no longer be holding. 
And then you can suddenly see the way. Stand up. Pray. If you got any prayer points out of what I have shared, this must have been the most careful and slow message I've preached in a long time. And there's a reason why. You are, you are the sound of rain. You are the answer. You are the solution. God has put something within you. This is not how you would have prayed if I asked you to pray against demons, devils, and nightmares. But this is more important. This is more powerful than that. God said here in the house of kings, there's just one or two people today that have a solution inside them. And the Lord is saying, help them move from murmuring to problem solving. Serve them bread and wine that their eyes may be open. I want you to ask, Father, that my eyes will be open today. Uh, I repent of thinking the solution is it's far away. I, I have discovered that you have a whole civilization within me that can solve the problem of our time. So Lord, I ask that right now, you will open my eye. Open the eye of my household, my family. It might be something within that same job that I just need to tweak and change. And it will suddenly connect. Open my eyes. Come on, ask that your eyes will be open. Father, in the name that's above every name. As Jesus did this that day. And the eyes of apostles, disciples were open. These are your disciples. They have come. In the midst of trouble, the nation is under siege. And they are your choice disciples. And you have appeared to us today by revelation. And now it is time for you to give us bread and wine. We ask in the name that is above every name. That everyone partakes today. That one person you sent me to. I know it wasn't for everybody. I, I understand. Lord, I know this is not one of those messages. But that one person you sent me to. That one or two people that you have buried and archived solutions. Solutions for families. Solutions for economies. Solutions for, for the political arena. Solutions for... Solutions in commerce, accounting solutions, solutions in, in entertainment, solutions in art, solutions, all kinds of solu solutions in, in the medical, solutions, solutions for the Nigerian youth, for the African youth, for the world. Those people that you have elected, you have called, you have chosen, you have put something within them. I ask, Lord, that as they take this, their eyes will be open. Thank you for the blessing of your blood and your body. We will never be the same again. In Jesus' name. Serve the people of God. Thank you. The prayer shouldn't stop. how the king lifts men to wealthy places. This is how he takes you to a wealthy place. Open down mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law, O oh God. Put that scripture back up. And he opened their eyes. He, he served them bread and wine and their eyes were open. Lord, I take bread Put the two verses together. And your people take bread. See, get ready, yo, because extraordinary inspiration is coming. And it will be accompanied with the power to execute it. So, if you don't have a job, don't worry. God designed it that you should not have a job. So that when he talks to you about what he's going to do, you have enough time within yourself to go and do it. Don't worry. It's in the plan. If you don't have money, it's okay. That's it. The person who has the money, they are, their hearts are in the hand of the king. What you need is that your eyes will be open. Because
because the labor of the fool wearies every one of them because they don't know the wages. This is the blood and the body of the way maker. The one that said I am the I am the way. The moment this gets into you, you start seeing the way. If you feel like you're trapped in any circumstance, God is making a way for you right now. I am prophesying. A way is made. A way. A way to pay bills is made. A way to fulfill your calling is made. A way to enter that destiny you only dreamt of is made. God is making a way. Has everybody been served? Please serve the children as well. Pray in the spirit. God is making a way for you. God is making a way for you. Thank you. 